Welcome back to the channel for practice problems for actuarial examinations. My name is Krzysztof Ostaszewski. You can see my name there. You can find information about me at smarturl.it forward slash Jedi. I direct the actuarial program at Illinois State University. You can find information about that program at smarturl.it forward slash actuary. If you would like to make a tax-deductible donation to our program and support our students, please go to smarturl.it forward slash help ISU actuary. Here's a problem for today. It's uh, from the Spring 2017 Exam MLC, a written answer section, problem number three. Sarah purchases a Type A universal life policy with a face amount of 100000 and pays an annual premium of 50000 You are given uh, data for policy year 1 and 2. Uh, percent of premium charge is 20% in year 1 and 8% in year 2. There is an annual expense charge of 75 and 75 this is an expense charge in addition to the 20% charge to the premium in the first year and 8% charge in the second year. Cost of insurance rate per 1,000 of insurance in year 1 is 0.025 and in year 2 is 0 0.030. Annual discount rate for cost of insurance is 4.5% um, in both years. This is the discount rate for used for discounting the cost of insurance charge to the beginning of the year. Annual credited interest rate is 6.5% in year 1, 5.75 in year 2. The corridor factor which determines um, whether the policy meets the criteria for being a life insurance policy under the, the tax code is 1.5 in year 1 and 1.4 in year 2. Show that the account value at the end of two years is 91,000 to the nearest 1,000. You should calculate the account value to the nearest one. So that was the first part of the question only, part A question. Now, for later parts, we also have these considerations. Sarah surrenders the policy at the end of the second year when she is age 60. The policy does not have a surrender charge. Sarah uses the surrender value as a net single premium to purchase a special last survival life annuity due with her husband, Grant, who is 10 years older than Sarah. The, this annuity provides the following payments at the beginning of each quarter. For the first 10 years, a guaranteed payment of Q. After the first 10 years, a payment of Q if Sarah is alive. After the first 10 years, a payment of 0.6 times Q if Grant is alive and Sarah is dead. You are given that the net single premium and reserves for this annuity are calculated based on the following, and these are the assumptions for the calculation. The future lifetimes of Sarah and Grant are independent. Mortality follows the illustrative life table. The interest rate is 6%. That's the same interest rate as in the table. Always pay attention to that. A double dot angle 10 upper 4, which is an interest theory of value, and you could possibly calculate it, but it's given, so that's kind of nice, is 7.634. The two-term Woolhouse formula. So that just tells you that for approximation of a, a, an annuity paid four times a year, you can use the Woolhouse formula to get it from the value of an annuity makes, making annual payments. So part B asks you to show that Q is 1950 to the nearest 50. You should calculate Q to the nearest 1. Grant dies during the 10th year of this annuity. Calculate the net premium reserve immediately prior to the payment of Q at the start of the 11th year. In the 11th year, Sarah decides that she no longer needs the annuity and asks the company to pay her the reserve. The insurance company refuses to pay the full reserve. So part D, the last part, says 
explain why the insurance company would not agree to Sarah's request. Let's look at part A now. Recall that type A, universal life um, insurance, uh, has um, level total benefit with additional death benefit declining. That's why this issue with corridor factor and so on. The account value rises, the benefit level is, uh, benefit is level, uh, and so the account value could reach the benefit amount, the full benefit amount, a death benefit, and the result would be that the insured is really insured with his or her own money, and the insurance company is not taking any risk, so why should the um, a tax agency treat this as a life insurance when it really looks like an investment account? And then, of course, they would want to tax it like an investment account. Um, so we will get to that in, in just a moment. But that design is what causes that tax consideration. For part A, we will calculate account values to understand the situation better. For each year, we first calculate the, the year-end account value without consideration for the corridor factor, then check whether the corridor factor applies and adjust as needed. Um, so starting from account value uh, uh, at, of zero at time zero, we have the following. So there is the initial account value plus premium after expenses. So 50,000 times 0 0.8 minus 75. Um, it's really 50,000 times 1 minus 0 0.2. That's what's left after the percentage of premium expenses. And then we subtract 75, uh, the, the level of expense. And we subtract from that the cost of insurance charge, uh, which is uh, 0.025 times net amount at risk, that is the uh, death benefit minus the account value, or normally net amount at risk uh, is defined as reserve minus, uh, I'm sorry, my, uh, death benefit minus the reserve, but the account value is the reserve here. Uh, and this is discounted from the year end when the payment of this net amount at risk happens. The full payment is 100000 which consists of the account value plus net amount at risk. So discounted at 4.5%. And all of this is now accumulated till the end of the year at the credit rate. And that's going to be equal to account value at time one. So, of course, this is a bit of a stra strange way to put it because account value at time one is at both sides, but you can see that that's the only unknown in this, so we can solve it for account value uh, at uh, time one, and uh, we get this linear equation in account value at time one, we solve it, and we get account value to be 41,017.34. And this tax regulation says that you're supposed to look at the ratio of total death benefit to the account value, and if this is at least equal to the corridor factor for this year, then there is no need to make any adjustments. Um, other, but if, if it's below, you actually have to increase the, the death benefit so that this ratio is at least what the corridor factor is. That's the whole story of the corridor factor. So in this case, death benefit div divided by account value is about 2.44. The corridor factor for this policy duration is 1.5. Everything is fine. So corridor factor has no effect on the policy at this policy duration, the first year, at the end of the first year. For the second year, we have the account value at time one plus premium after expenses minus the cost of insurance charge accumulated at the credited rate is equal to account value at time two. And again, the account value is um, here the only unknown, so we solve it. It's on both sides, but it's just a linear equation. And we get 91,689.22. Now, this time the ratio is below the corridor factor. 
the, which means that the death benefit will have to be adjusted so that the ratio of the death benefit to account value is exactly the, the it's the required minimum it's the corridor factor of 1.4 so the death benefit will have to be made equal to 1.4 times account value at time 2 and this means that death benefit minus the account value will be equal to 0.4 times account value at time 2 now notice that it's not that we take the account value that we just calculated no, no, no. We have to redo the account value calculation because by changing the death benefit, we change the cost of insurance charge. So we have to redo the whole thing, but with this put in as the assumption that the net amount at risk, death benefit minus account value, is actually equal to exactly 0.4 account times account value at time 2. So the equation for the account value becomes the initial account value plus premium after expenses minus the cost of insurance charge um, discounted at the beginning of the year. Um, then the, the whole thing accumulated at the credited rate is equal to account value at time two. This is really a generalization of the standard recursive reserve formula, which you probably know if you read any of the things that I write about MLC, to me it's like the most standard, the most important, the, the beloved formula for the reserve. You need to know your recursive formula for the reserve. This is a form of it. Um, so all of this is just step by step from one year to another year, a recursive calculation. As you can see, the account value is of both. Um, both sides, so we have to solve it, but it's a linear equation. We solve it, we get about 90,838.42. This is 91,000 to the nearest thousand and 90,838 uh, to the nearest one. Now, for part B, the annuity. Well, the annuity is Q paid quarterly, so the annual rate of payment is 4Q. And then what we have is that annuity is paid with certainty for 10 years. So the first thing that you see here is 10 years uh, of an annuity certain annuity factor. Now then, after 10 years, if Sarah is alive, uh, then it's uh, conditional to survival with this. Uh, pure endowment is a discount factor that counts for both interest and mortality. So 10 E60 is that. Exactly, for Sarah. And then and if she's alive, then she is, she's then 70 years old, and she's getting that annuity. Um, or 0. 0.6 times the standard benefit paid to Grant. Of course, it's paid if Grant is alive, but Sarah is not. But it has to be conditional on Grant's survival. And then, it's either this way, that Sarah survives the first 10 years, dies later, uh, and Grant is alive after her death, because the 0.6 times the standard benefit is paid uh, to Grant if he survives longer than Sarah. Or Sarah dies during the first 10 years, but Grant is alive after her death. Okay, And of course, as I said at the beginning, this is conditional on Grant's survival of the first 10 years when there's annuity certain paid. So one thing that you should notice is that in, in this notation that we had there, we had this a double dot y vertical line x. This refers to a reversionary annuity. It's an annuity that starts upon the first death of an y, year old, y years old and continues until the second death of an X years old. And you have Y vertical line X. The simplest way to remember which one goes where is that the one that dies first is first. Y vertical line X means that the payment is made after Y dies as long as X is still alive. Now recall that that 
reversionary annuity is actually equal to a double dot x minus a double dot x colon y. Why? Because when x is alive and y is alive, then both of these annuities uh, cancel, so the payment is zero. And if um, we have a situation that x is not alive, but um, but y is alive, oh, I'm sorry, the other way around. If we have a situation that x is alive, but y is not alive, then the payment is 1. On the other hand, if x is not alive, then both are 0, so the payment is 0. In this case that we're working with, we're actually using this annuity in the form of uh, model annuity paid quarterly, but all the rules apply the same. So a double dot uh, 70 vertical line 80 upper 4 is the same as a double dot 80 upper 4 minus a double dot 80 colon 70 um, upper 4. So the annuity considered has this expected value where we just substitute the reversionary annuity by the difference of the two annuities. And instead of 10Q60, we write 1 minus 10P60. And then we use the, um, the fact that uh, um, this... Uh, actually, we don't, we don't need to use anything special here, we just multiply it out and then we notice that uh, 10p60 times a double dot 80 up 4 cancels with the same term with a minus sign. So the first term is from the first expression, the second is from the second expression. And what we have left inside is minus 10p60 times a double dot 80 colon 70 up 4 plus a double dot 80 up 4. And uh, we can also write uh, the product of uh, 10e70 times um, 10p60 as 10e60 colon 70. Uh, it's conditional on the joint life status survival, a pure endowment. Okay, so then this is what we get, and we are supposed to do the calculation of all this. So we need to find all the quantities given and the, to finish the, the calculations. So the, the annuity certain is actually given in the problem, the value of it. The two-term Woolhouse formula is a double dot x upper m is approximately equal to a, a double dot x minus m minus 1 over 2m. You know you must memorize it. And the three-term Woolhouse formula, which is a double dot x upper m is approximately a double dot x minus m minus 1 over 2m minus m squared minus 1 over 12m squared times delta plus mu x. In this case, we're just using two term. So we use it for a double dot uh, 70 upper 4, and we write it as approximately a double dot 70 minus uh, 3 eighths. A double dot 70 is in the illustrative life table, so we plug that in, and we get the approximate value of um, uh, the annuity a double dot 70 upper 4 as 8.1943. We use the same two-term uh, Woolhouse formula for a double dot 80 upper 4, and we get it to be about 5.53 by using the value of 5.9050 from the illustrative life table for a double dot 80. And again, we use it for a double dot upper 4 70 colon 80, um, because a double dot 70 colon 80 is also in the table. Um, and now we have all these three annuities that appear in, in the calculation. The uh, pure endowment factor for a 60-year-old over 10 years is in the table. Again, it's point, uh, 0 0.4512. We know that the same interest rate is used in the problem as in the table. That's why we can use the pure endowment factors. And pure endowment factor for a 70-year-old over 10 years is 0 0.33037, again, from the table. And uh, 10e60 colon 70, um, well, that's really, uh, because of it, these are independent lives, you can just write this thing as 10p60 times uh, 10p70 times um, 
1.06 to the negative 10 and then if you combine 1.06 to the negative 10 with each of the probabilities then you get the pure endowment factors but you only have one uh, 1.06 to the negative uh, 10 so because you took two of them, you have to compensate and multiply this by 1.06 to the tenth. So this um, endowment for joint life is the product of endowments times 1.06 to the tenth. All of these things, well, and except for the interest, except 1.06 to the tenth, are in the table. So we um, plug it in and we get uh, a value of approximately uh, 0.26694903. Plugging this all in, uh, we get the expected value of the annuity to be approximately 46.7463Q. But the account value at time 2, which was approximately 90,838.42, is used to purchase the annuity. So the two quantities by the equivalence principle um, are set equal to each other. And that this becomes an equation for Q. We solve it for Q and we conclude that Q is approximately equal to 1,943.21. Now at the beginning of the 11th year for Part C, at the beginning of the 11th year, there are no future premiums to be paid. So the net premium reserve immediately prior to the payment of Q at the start of the 11th year is just the actual present value of future benefits. What are the benefits? 4Q per year paid as a quarterly annuity, as long as 70 year old is alive, which is 4Q A double dot 70 upper 4, and that's 4 times 1943.21, which is calculated. We established the value of the annuity before 8.1943, so uh, the answer is that this is approximately 63,692.98. Now for part D, well, first of all, you could say, well, it's not that easy to get money out of an insurance company. But no, there's a little bit more to this. Pricing of annuity contracts assume, assumes pooling of longevity risk. So uh, if you say, well, I just want my money, then um, what you're saying is, um, I don't care about the, the price of risk that's that some people may live longer, some people may not live as long. Uh, this is spread, the risk is spread among them and is probably spread um, fairly so people who are likely to live shorter may pay a higher price, uh, may pay a, a lower price for the annuity because they'll get less. But, um, well, fairness of the pricing is not really an issue here. The point is that the company needs the money to pay for people who will live very long and the people who change their mind are already locked into the contract. So the, the reserve is the expected present value of future benefits. Um, it's held for some customers who li will live longer and some who will live shorter lives. Of course, there's less of a reserve needed for shorter lives. Assuming surrenders with reserve payouts would un, um, allowing actually allowing uh, would undermine the risk sharing, as the lives with higher risk of death would surrender, and their funds would not be available to offset the costs of the annuities for the survivors. Um, so the insurance company can't afford to be like this. Um, it's it would be akin to people who buy life insurance. Uh, for say 10 years or 20 years term insurance, they survive all the years and then uh, they turn around to the insurance company and say, hey, I want my money back, I didn't die, so you didn't provide me any protection. No, uh, there was protection. Something could have happened to that person. So no, the insurance company is not going to give her what she wants because she's being unreasonable. Please remember this is copyrighted material. Uh, the problem comes from a Society of Actuaries examination. So of course it belongs to the society. It's reproduced with permission. Good luck in your studies and good luck on the test.